free is if you tell me you own fans online, uh -huh. they'll send it to you for free. So just go on that little web form. I have a link to it and all the good stuff. <laughs> Next thing you need is a nice little thumb drive. Uh, most thumb drives will work. There's a couple of them in there that, that we list that, uh, that, aren't, that won't work with this. But this one here just happens to be a combination MP3 player slash thumb drive. Don't, the MP3 player does nothing. I just happen to have this one laying around. Sure, actually. Um, plug this in here to the top here. And then you have <laughs> your controller with a USB thumb drive full of storage on here. Now, what you want to do is you want to find the Mech Assault hack. There's a hack out there, an exploit for Mech Assault, that you want to copy to your USB thumb drive. That's why you have it. You hook this into your computer first. And then you copy that over, then you have it installed on here, and then you can plug it into your controller, which is then going to be accessible through your Xbox. So let's just say you start your Xbox up here, and you go into the memory, and uh, you go into the controller here, and you're going to see that the exploit has been copied here. Here I happen to do the, the Linux installer here, but you can and copy, there's a couple different uh, exploits that are available. Uh, you find this offline. Go so ahead. So did Microsoft? I mean, you know, did Microsoft like beat the people who who developed Microsoft with a stick? For that this? is a Microsoft game. So they oh, beat, Microsoft they beat themselves. Yes. With a stick? Yes. And, That's so uh, nice of them. It's Microsoft. <laughs> There's also another one, 007, but they fixed right. it in later versions. Uh, so what you do here is select this game copy, copy it over to your Xbox hard drive, just like you would any other mm -hmm. game save. Once you've done that, then you can reboot the machine and put Microsoft in here. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up here, put Microsoft in, and uh, it should launch here in just a second. It's going to launch Mech Assault, and then it's going to see that new game save that has been saved to your hard drive, so that, you know, it's been copied over. No need, you don't really have to worry about the memory stick much longer after that. Uh, here it goes right here, Microsoft Xbox, standard, unmodded. I disabled the mod chip in mine, so that would say the Microsoft logo still. <laughs> and uh, Mech Assault's going to load right up, and then you go into the campaign option, and you'll notice that one of the saved games is called Run Linux. <laughs> and uh, once you run that, it is going to uh, start Evolution X. And Evolution X is uh, the replacement mm -hmm. desktop, I'm going to take this out here so that I can boot, boot into it, turn this off, cycle the power, and then we'll show you what Evolution X looks like. I'm going to simulate it here because I don't want to overwrite any of my files since mine's already been done. Right. Uh, we'll start it up here. It'll take you right into Evolution X. Now, Evolution X is, like I said, the replacement desktop. It gets rid of that whole green screen. You'll notice when this boots up here, you're not going to see uh, the the, the, uh, yeah, the two. That means my mod chip is in, uh, enabled and working. So here's Evolution X. And what this is going to allow you to do at this point, once you've gotten this far, is go into the system utilities and choose the settings. Now, you want to hook a LAN, uh, you know, hook this up to your network, plug it into your hub, and give it an internal IP address. Here I gave it 192.168.1.50. And then you're going to take your computer here, I have uh, set up on our desktop here, and you're going to type in, like, give it a, another internal IP address. I put here 192.168.1.51. And that's uh, the com desktop computer that I'm using here. So once I, uh, once I set this up, I'll be able to talk to my Xbox. I can FTP right into my Xbox cool. and then overwrite the files. Now, this is completely without a mod chip. Right. Uh, the only reason mine have that is because I already have it installed. Right. So uh, you copy those files over. There's another exploit uh, that you need to copy over, a few different files. It's all in the article. There's, there's several files that you need to acquire and copy over. Once you do that, you're going to have a modded Xbox, and then you'll be able to go back in. You'll be able to sign games. You can go into things like launch menu. Here's like backed up games. You can see here that you can just select any game that you want. You've loaded these games. I've right? loaded these games. They don't these, magically appear. No, these do don't that. just magically appear on your hard drive. These are <laughs> games that I own that I actually put into the device right. and then backed them up. Uh, also things like the Xbox Media Center. You can play all different types of media mm -hmm. files and video. Really cool one that came out on the show in a, in a few weeks. It's, it's so much better. So many different things you can do it. For detailed instructions and links to all the stuff I talked about today, check out my article, KevinRose.com. It's all up there. Very cool. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. No soldering required. And you don't have to reinsert the, the Mech Assault disk every Once time. Once you get it all hacked and done, you won't, won't have to mess with Mech Assault. And I forgot to mention the coolest thing, though, is the Linux distro you can put on here as well. It's awesome. awesome. Web browsing, file server, you name it. Linux distro is the way to go. That's what I did with mine. I didn't even mess with this. But. Thanks, Microsoft. Thank you very much. Nicely done. Still to come, we're going to check out a robotic suit that gives you superhuman strength. And up next, Chris is looking for the best option for broadband cable, DSL, satellite. What should he choose? We're going to tell you all about it when the screen savers continue. <laughs> Don't forget to register for the Screensavers LAN party. Powered by NVIDIA. The game is Nova Logic's Joint Ops multiplayer demo. Like many other first-person shooters, this game is packed full of weapons, 35 weapons to be exact. Plus a slew of ve vehicles from Blackhawks to Little Birds, the Striker Attack Vehicles, and the Mark V Patrol Boats. Plus, the game allows for 100 players per server. There's mayhem in a box. 100. That's going to be awesome. Or very slow. Is that going to work, Dan? 100 players? Yeah, really? really optimized netcode, so really? it's awesome. Nice. Awesome. We're going to get 100 of you in there. So go to g4techtv.com slash LAN party and register for the links 
to play. Click on the register for the LAN party link, and it's a 250 megabyte demo. So start, da start, start downloading, downloading now. now. We'll see you Thursday <laughs> for the Screensavers LAN party. All right, Chris joins us on the phone from, is that Wynn, Arkansas, Chris? That's Wynn, you got it. Cool. Hey, Kevin, hey, Patrick, how y'all doing? Good, Good. how yourself? you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Hey, first of all, I got to say, it was great to see y'all with the merge and everything. You guys staying on the air, it was, uh, it was a really great thing to see. I was really worried about that. You guys, Sarah, Dan, Yoshi, everybody behind the scenes, all props go out to you guys. You give us great stuff every day at home. Well, thank you very thank much. You. We appreciate that. We are glad to be here. It's a good uh, thing. Glad yes, for you to be there. <laughs> thanks. Anyway, my question is, um, I'm, in the, I'm in the market for broadband mm -hmm. right now, and uh, I was wanting to know the pros and cons of either going with DSL, cable, satellite. And I was wondering if you, you guys had any suggestions. Do you I mean, have it's a pretty small town, so, you know, the speeds are different. W with it being a small town, do you have all the options available to you? Yeah, that's yeah, our actually, first question. just now available. DSL just became available. Okay. Cable about a year ago. And, of course, satellite. You know, supposedly they say you can get it anywhere, and I live on a hill. So right. Okay. I that's, could definitely get that. That's awesome because we didn't get, you know, cable and uh, cable broadband in San Francisco until like a year ago. Yeah, oh, really? yeah. <laughs> so. We actually got cable before we got DSL. That's so, pretty awesome. That's cool. The uh, first of all, we're going to say satellite is is if you are in the middle of nowhere, if you are never going to get DSL, if you're never going to get you know, satellite, and you don't mind the fact that the latencies are so high, because you basically you go from you know the antenna in your backyard up to the satellite, back down to the earth, and then into the internet, right. which basically the latencies are so long, it takes so many you know millions of tens of a thousands of a second, so many so milliseconds. Forget right. online gaming. Then. Yeah, you're not going to be online gaming. Great for right. downloads. Great for browsing the web. You know, great for downloading the, the next 433 Windows updates for Windows XP security <laughs> holes. Much better than a dial-up connection for that, but horrible for online gaming. So okay. we can do basically, plus it's expensive, plus it usually requires an external box. It makes it difficult to connect to a router, so... Hard to share with other machines yeah, that you have in I'd the house. I'd skip yeah. satellite. Okay. So out of DSL or cable, um, cable, if, if you have cable companies on top of it and they maintain the head end, like they don't basically let too many users try to cram onto one head end, um, cable is generally going to give you the best performance. Pretty much anything, whether you're dial-up, satellite, cable, DSL, you're going to have that, like, wherever, like, 6 p.m. dinner time around your neighborhood, when everybody basically gets off the highway, out of their cars, into the house, and starts downloading MP3s, like, all of them are going to take a hit in the early evening until the later evening. So there's a um, crappy jam. Yeah. yeah. Have, okay. Is I it still is it still a problem? You, you said you were up on the hill. Is it still a problem with DSL as far as the length the way you are from the telco? Because I know uh, that used to be an actually, issue. Actually, that was the problem to get DSL up to this point. They right. finally got it up here. Okay. Uh, it just became available here recently. So that's why I was calling. Uh, you know, I was going to go with cable, but, mm -hmm. you know, people have talk, told me that DSL was better. And also I've heard things about the filters that you have to put on with DSL, like the, the for security, for telephones, faxes. Yeah, I've got a TiVo, so things like that. Yeah, I mean, the, we haven't, I mean, we had a, uh, I, when they originally installed DSL in my house, which was like three years ago, they had mm -hmm. to put one filter on the main line and everything right. else ran through that. Um, depending on what DSL system they use, you shouldn't really have too much of a problem with filters at this point. I mean, it's never been that annoying of a problem. Right. Um, I basically, you, you've kind of already started the thing you should do, Chris, is start talking to your neighbors. Anybody who's got cable, anybody who's got DSL, ask them to do throughput tests, ask them how they feel about it, ask yeah. them how customer support is. You know, do you already have cable? Is it going to cost you $55 a month for cable plus another 40 bucks a month for, for you know, for broadband yeah. cable? Um, Chris, another website you could go to, the broadbandreports.com. They have mm -hmm. the speed test on there that you can try. And also, there's a message board on there where people all over the country post their results and how they're getting, you know, what type of rates, data transfer rates they're receiving as well. So you might want to check that out and see, uh, you know, how the area area is doing. Yeah. The best thing to do is basically ask around and see what, see what everybody's getting in your neighborhood, what yep. they like best. But generally, you know, cable should give you a larger pipe if it's maintained well by your local cable affiliate. Thanks for the call, Chris. Good one. Now here is Sarah with some info about the next Digital dig, digital Digs Roadshow. Digital That's a dig, 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 twister. Dig, say it three times fast. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> if you haven't heard yet, the G4 Tech TV Digital Digs Roadshow is heading to Cherry Hill New Joy Z this weekend. So come on out and meet none other than Yoshi and Dan from the show on Saturday, June 19th from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Sunday, June 20th from noon till 5 at the Moorestown Mall. Cherry Hill, right outside of Philly. For more information on this roadshow and future ones, go to g4techtv.com slash digital digs. Digital digs. Digital digs. Blah, blah, blah. Don't go anywhere. Patrick talks with LA Laker Rick Fox about, no, not about the Lakers, about RC cars.
And after the break, a new robotic technology helps soldiers and rescue crews carry heavy loads over great distances for hours. We're going to take a closer look at that when the screensavers continue. <laughs> Welcome back to the Screen Savers. I'm Patrick Norton. Coming up in this half hour, I got to sit down with LA Raker Rick Fox and talk to him about his newfound interest in remote control cars and more of your live calls. We're going to answer them. Now, imagine striding through the desert with a 70 pound load in your back, feeling absolutely nothing, free and unburdened. Well, that's the vision behind the Berkeley Lower Extremities exoskeleton, or bleaks, if I've got that right. A strap on robotic legs give an ordinary human an extraordinary amount of strength, carry a huge amount of weight. Joining us is the architect of this amazing technology, Professor. Kazaruni, home of you. Nice to see you again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Director of UC Berkeley Robotics and Human Engineering Laboratory. Now, welcome to the screensavers. This isn't a, you know, it's kind of, we always think of robotics as, is kind of like moving off autonomous vehicles, you know, in, you know, the Darby Grand Challenge, roaring through the desert. You're not really looking to replace humans with this project. Uh, no, we believe uh, the state of technology in autonomous robotics is actually lagging. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, act, uh, it is uh, quite profitable to or appropriate to use robotic devices with he people and mm -hmm. augment human capability, physical capability, mechanical capability, and also in terms of information with robots mm -hmm. as opposed to replace people uh, with robots. So, it's probably a lot simpler to make it easier for people to carry more weight and move more than it is to teach a robot how to sort of have cognitive decisions and make good judgment calls. Exactly. Uh, autonomous robots are not good in unstructured environments, mm -hmm. unstructured tasks. But it is a good combination to, to use robots, uh, mechanical strength, in, in combination with human intellect. And that will be great for in, uh, unstructured tasks like walking, going up the stairs, downstairs, mm -hmm. and, and doing tasks that uh, require human intelligence. So that we found this is the best combination. Oh, this makes me think that we, we see the mechanism here on the screen. It, it makes me remind me of, of the Aliens movie with Ridley, and she has the, the, right. the equipment moving. Right. It's, it's, you know, obviously your work's funded by DARPA. This yes. is a, a project out of the Pentagon. Right. But there's probably, where do you see this going in terms of after DARPA or after the military? Right. Well, as you know, DARPA funds uh, projects that are in infancy. Mm -hmm. That is to say, they're risky, um, but they have very uh, a large return. Mm -hmm. So we think this uh, lower extremity exoskeleton can be used for firefighters, can be used for hikers, uh, and, and also, the fundamental technologies we develop in terms of electronics, in terms of control theory, in terms of applications um, and design, these are all can be used for uh, individuals with uh, limited mobility, perhaps in a, in a future. Because somebody could actually uh, give paraplegic the ability to walk or, or more of Not at this time. Not, not at this time. time. The technology we developed here is basically allows a person to wear this device. Mm -hmm. And if you have uh, a backpack, basically takes the load of the backpack from you and the machine will take the load. So that's like a basic building block of this technology. We talked about this a little bit before the show, the, the Berkeley Lower Extremity Exoskeleton. It works, you, you got, it doesn't guide you. So that was no. the question I had. Are you guiding it or is it kind of pushing you around? Uh, basically the exoskeleton shadows you. If you go forward, the machine will come forward. If you go backward, the machine will go backward. Basically mm -hmm. the machine is a slave of the person. And all it does, it measures its own information from its own device. And, uh, and, and then what it does, it predicts, it estimates how to get out of your way. So if you go forward, oh, wow. the machine will go forward. How much weight is this allowing people to carry right now? Right now, the machine is about uh, 100 pounds, mm -hmm. and uh, 9,500 pounds, and it will carry about 70 pounds, mm -hmm. and the pilot will not feel much force. And if you increase the payload to like 200 pounds, mm -hmm. then the remaining payload, the remaining load would be felt by the pilot. Got it. Yeah. So it kind of splits the difference on That's the weight right. on that. Yeah. It's an assist device. It's a machine that helps the person to carry loads uh, with little, uh, without, without getting tired. Mm -hmm. So you're actually wearing, I mean, it's interesting to look at that, the motion, you, you have an exoskeleton, right. it's, it looks like it's hydraulically powered. Is it, how hard is it to copy? There's so many, I mean, you think about the hip joint, the knee joints, the flex of the ankle, how hard is it to emulate human motion? Well, in fact, the entire, all the degrees of freedom on the machine uh -huh. are themselves, the way we pick them up, the way we chose them, the way we design them itself are, are the components of this research work. Mm -hmm. So we design a machine that actually mimics the person without actually occupying the person's mm -hmm. position, number one. Number two is the control algorithm with this machine. Uh, estimates how to move around so the person does not feel much force. It won't impede you at all. If you go forward, it will go forward. It's pretty amazing. The controllers, are, are there multiple? You have an example of I one. have an example of a, uh, a controller here, you can see. Is and this there the are, there are several of these uh, controllers. 
all over the legs and basically they get information from different sensors and communicate with all the actuators mm -hmm. and the information from here will go to the central computer and the computer will make decision uh, how to go away so uh, the person does not feel much forces because of the device. Now this isn't an off-the-shelf you know, digital no, signal no, no, processor no. from TI. This is pretty, did you guys, did you guys design this and build it yourself? This is the fundamental building blocks of a nervous system for the exoskeleton system and, and there are many of them all over the legs and they allow uh, communication um, between all kinds of sensory uh, information and the computer around the leg. Was the mechanical issues of the engineering for the, for the legs themselves trivial compared to building the controllers and the software? No, every element of that was quite difficult, mostly because we're dealing with a person here. The person had to feel comfortable. Sure. So the mechanical elements are also very important because they shouldn't impede the person. They should be uh, rather small. Um, and, and I, I really cannot tell you which part of it was the hardest, but I think all of them were equally hard. Sounds like it was pretty exciting. What's, what's the next... Uh, What's the next step? Where do you guys take it next? Well, we would like to make this machine a lot smaller. We want to make sure the payload is higher. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure the mission time is longer than what it is right now. We want to make sure uh, the number of sensors and actuators come down. We want to make sure the system is more robust. So we have a list of all kinds of work to do. And this is really the beginning of machines of this nature mm -hmm. that we provided, we invented at Berkeley. You know, wild fantasy. How long do you think it might be before you know we walk into an REI and backpackers are picking these up? Or I, I or think uh, I would I would I would predict uh, a few years, a couple of years, or two years uh, would be the time that you would see machines uh, that backpackers, hikers mm -hmm. will wear that stuff. So take from their shoulder it would be less. It's pretty well. So you mentioned it's actually it's not powered by batteries. It's powered by a gasoline motor. It is uh, powered by gasoline mostly because uh, a, a, we thought this machine is subclass of a family of a, a other family of a mobile systems like motorcycles and cars. And if this is another mobile system, we might as well make this thing feel refuelable. And this is perhaps uh, one of the you know the first refuelable robots that you see, which is worn by a human. And of course, we can always uh, turn into um, electric uh, powered machine for indoor applications. And, uh, and perhaps other uh, fuels also. Professor Kazarini. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Check out more about the Berkeley Low Extremities Exoskeleton at their website. The address is bleaks.me.berkeley.edu, and we'll have links to that in the show notes. Cool stuff. Stay where you are. Find out if replacing your router's antenna will increase your network speed or lower it. But up next, his team is in the NBA Finals right now. I got a chance to sit down and talk with Los Angeles Laker Rick Fox about his newfound interest very newfound interest in RC cars. See what he had to say when the screen savers continue. Currently, the LA Lakers are getting whipped by the Detroit Pistons in the NBA Finals. <coughs> and we say that because we like to torture our executive producer, Paul Block, who is a diehard Lakers fan. And Dan, but he only says that whatever team's in the finals, Dan likes. I don't think so. <laughs> but the series was Big tied. Laker fan. The series was tied one to one when Patrick talked to one of the Lakers, but not about basketball. Yeah. Though. Let's take a look. Our next guest is an NBA veteran, a Los Angeles Laker, who also happens to have a keen interest in X-Mods RC cars. We want to welcome Rick Fox, via satellite from Los Angeles. 